Good evening. Good to see you this evening. Hope your week's going well. Let's turn to 354. 354, leaning on the everlasting arms. We'll sing all three verses. 354, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. And let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us that we can lean upon you day in and day out. Thank you for your word that we can trust and help us indeed to do so. Well, thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to 417, if you would, please. No one understands like Jesus. 417. We'll sing all four verses. No one understands like Jesus. He is a friend beyond compare. No one understands like Jesus. He's a friend beyond compare. Meet him at the throne of mercy. He is waiting for you there. No one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim. No one is so near, so dear as Jesus. Cast your every care on him. No one understands like Jesus. Every woe he sees and feels Tenderly he whispers comfort And the broken heart he heals No one understands like Jesus When the days are dark and grim No one is so near, so dear as Jesus Cast your every care on him. No one understands like Jesus when the foes of life assail. You should never be discouraged. Jesus cares and will not fail. No one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim, no one is so near, so dear as Jesus. Cast your every care on him. No one understands like Jesus when you falter on the way. Though you fail him, sadly fail him. He will pardon you today. No one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim. 
no one is so near, so dear as Jesus. Cast your every care on Him. Amen. Take your bulletin, if you would, please, just to remind you about food that we have. If you need especially pasta or some canned goods, we have that. Please feel free to take what you can use. Let us know after church if you can use it or if you know of someone who can use it. Saturday evening, turn your clocks back because it is fall back. It's not my decision. That's the government's decision, something they made years and years and years and years ago. But regardless, we get an extra hour of sleep, so please don't forget to fall back Saturday evening. Then we have the 18th where we're planning the decorating for the church for Christmas about 6 o'clock. That's a Thursday evening, so please keep that in mind. And then our Thanksgiving service will be the following Tuesday, the 23rd, at 7 o'clock. COVID cases keep going down and down, and that's a very good thing. So praise the Lord for that, too. Jimmy is going to play this evening for you, which is number 477, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Thank you, Jimmy. All right. Are there any any blessings this week? Any praises that you have from last Thursday to today? Sarah? Better in history than I thought I would. Better in history than you thought you would? So instead of a 50, you got 51, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, you did very well, if I remember right. All A's in history. All A's in history. All A's in math, too. And English, yeah. So praise the Lord for that. Then that's a blessing. Anyone else? Jimmy? I got 100 in math. Got 100 in math? My piano lesson went well. Your piano lesson went well. That's good. Phoebe? That's true, yeah. And you learned how to make keys. Yeah. And you're getting, what did you do on your quiz today? <laughs> I had a quiz today? You had, yes, you had a quiz today. Oh, I thought you did get 100. You see, you got like 7 out of 7. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Those are, those are blessings. And you're thankful for Andre the Moon Pie Man, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a running joke. There's a man that brings moon pies to the Ace Hardware employees, right? Yes. She got, you got what? What are they, pecan pies this time around? I didn't know moon pies made pecan pies, but apparently they do. 
They're not half bad either. Any other blessings? School has gone well this week, so that's that's a, always a blessing. And thankful that the cat is getting better. So he just finished up his medication on Sunday, so I was a little concerned, but he's he's steadily improving and getting used to us more, and that's nice. So thankful for that. And we had the girls had um, they probably forgot about this one, but. We went to Close House on Thursday and found a sewing machine. It's similar to my wife's and another one we have here in the building, old Kenmore. And it was stuck in reverse. It would only go the wrong way. So I oiled it and oiled it, poked it and prod it. Eventually, thankfully, got it. It, it had a little little piece that was stuck. So thankfully, we got a sewing machine for five dollars that's a blessing because the girls need a sewing machine after their last one almost exploded so but we've been selling parts of it on the on ebay so (laughs) so yeah it's always always nice to be able to save a little money in this case a lot of money and we still have to get I, i forget which one owns the sewing machine today. It's either Phoebe, oh, it's Phoebe's, okay. So we still have to get Andrea one, but thankful for that blessing because that's the only thing that's wrong with it. I know you would never do this, but just just a word of caution. If you're going to donate something, please donate things that work <laughs> to, to places where people are going to buy them. <laughs> we have that all the time at Close House. Now, Bachman's back here, they, they test everything. But Close House, people just donate their junk. Thankfully, most of the time you can fix it, but <laughs> it's just, it's something. Someone donated a sewing machine that only ran in reverse. <laughs> you know. Oh my, but their loss is our gain. Any other blessings this week? Okay. Well, on your way to Ephesians 5, turn to Luke chapter 5, if you would, please. And we will, Lord willing, finish up this list. I thought for sure we'd do it Sunday, but that didn't happen. We'll finish up this list on the fruit of the flesh tonight. Get to the fruit of the Spirit on Sunday. But Luke chapter 5... The Bible says, verse number one, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake, and the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes on their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon, And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. When they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. I've read this chapter over the years many times, especially because there's a message that I had preached over the years out of verse 4, launch out into the deep. And this time around, 
the Lord just showed me um, just what this passage is really about. It's so easy for people to focus on launch out into the deep, and this is what God will give you. He'll give you a great draught of fish. And that's not what the focus on this is at all. If you look and consider even the context of the entire scripture, the focus is never on what we can get from God. It's on God, and in this case, Jesus Christ. And it's Christ trying to teach Peter, Andrew, James, and John some things about himself, that he is the master of all creation. He is the Christ, and he calls them to what we call the gospel ministry here in verse number 10. And so we can focus on two things in life. We can focus on what we hope to get from God, or we can focus on God and understand that God, God is the one worth following, whether we get the great draught of fishes or not. You see, uh, aside from that, a great uh, bit of humility here from Peter to where Jesus says, hey, let your net down. And Peter says, well, we've toiled all the night. We've taken nothing. Peter's the expert fisherman. You know, we all, we all have our things that we are more educated in, more experienced in than others. Peter's was fishing. What Jesus told him to do didn't make sense but he humbled himself. He said, you told me to do something. He said, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net, and that's faith. When God tells us to do something, if it doesn't make sense to our brains, if it's against what we know to be logical or sensible or even based upon our experience, because God's word says to do it, we do it anyway. Faith, right? Looking unto Jesus, trusting in his word. Peter did that. He was blessed because of it. Now, people tend to forget this, though. He left all the fish behind. See, it's not about getting what you can get from Christ. It's about Christ. It's about following him. They left all those fish behind. And this is the, the incident that we allude to in John 21 where Jesus does a similar thing. So just a, a thing to share with you this evening. Finishing up on the fruit of the flesh, let's look at Ephesians 5. We'll be in part 67 of this series of giving thanks always as we look at verse number 20, which says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray you'd speak to our hearts and help us to be made better for you. Help us to surround ourselves with people that love you and to glean good counsel from your word. We live in a dark, corrupt world where so many people disbelieve your word. We just pray you would help us. Well, thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As our outline goes, are you thankful for God, uh, that you are God's child? Are you thankful that you are God's child? Remember, it's about Christ. Now, we know that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We are saved from our sin because of Jesus, that our salvation is not all about focusing on our salvation. You know, there's people that try to live the Christian walk, and they, all they do every Sunday is they focus on heaven, heaven, heaven. They focus on the Jesus coming back on a white horse, and we're coming back with him. They focus on so many things that are not now, and they forget about Christ. They forget about God's word. Are you thankful that you're God's child? If you're thankful that you're God's child, we will study the word of God. So many, so many people neglect 
their personal devotional walk. And because of that, so many people are falling apart at the seams. People say, well, I read my Bible. I'm still falling apart. Then you're doing it wrong. And I can guarantee that. It's a true statement that says that a person, uh, a person that has a Bible that is falling apart usually is not doing so themselves, right? But it's even more deeper than that where we have to study to apply the scriptures. We have to make it ours. We have to work through it. Not getting the same you know, shallow things out of it. Oh, Jesus loves me every single day. I'm not saying we shouldn't be happy that Jesus loves us. But looking for what God has for us, for our lives specifically, that we need to work on. Are you thankful to be God's child? Are you thankful for God's word? Have you been in it this week and studying it? Making it the foundation of your life it's a wonderful thing that we can do that. Phoebe had a discussion thing, right? On as she's, uh, I'm, I'm impressed so far at these Bible, this Bible class she's in because they're asking the hard questions and they should. They should be asking the hard questions. The questions that so many people refuse to answer today and the question that she had to answer and she's having a discussion with the teacher with or with the class with, is how can a loving God send people to hell? And she has to answer that from the Bible. And really, the, the truth is, how can a loving God not send us to hell when he has duly warned us and he has provided Christ who gives us a way out? People say, oh, God's just mean. Well, you can believe that if you want to, and plenty of people do. But those people don't believe this book. As that was part of the question was, what experiences have you had with people that believe God's mean, basically, believe that God's not a loving God? And she hasn't really had that, but I have, and Sarah has. And so she asked the teacher, well, can I use my dad's experiences? And he said, well, that's fine. And if I've run into one, I've run into a dozen, showing you that people are all the same, really, where the problem is people don't believe this book. They don't believe the Bible's the word of God. And that's been proven time after time after time because I've talked to the people and they reject God's word. <laughs> time after time after time. You say, well, how can, people, how, how can people do that? They do, and by the millions they do. Sad to say. They want to go and they want to follow. You see, the Christian walk is not about us and what makes us feel good. The Christian walk is about humbling ourselves before God and his word. That doesn't make us feel good at all many times. But it's about saying this is the supreme authority in our lives and we're going to follow it because we believe in Christ and not many people want to do that, do they? Not many people want to live that. That's the major issue. That's where they get, oh, God's just mean. Because they read in the Old Testament where God orders the Israelites to kill people and to do this, that, and the other. And people work off of a basis of presumption and it makes them feel good to believe, oh, well, I, I would never order those people to be killed. I would never send people to hell. I mean, I would never let Jimmy go to hell if I was God. You see what those people are doing. They're comparing themselves to the divine and they're elevating their own supposed morality, their own intellect above the creator and it makes them feel superior. You see that, right? And that's what humanity enjoys doing because that's our flesh. 
Are you thankful that you have God's word where we can understand we do have a loving God? He gives us everything that we need to be saved. He gives us the gospel. If we didn't have the gospel, we have creation and conscience. We have everything we need to follow truth and light, to know about his son, to know how to have our sins forgiven. He's a loving God. How can he not send us to hell when he's duly warned us, right? Very clear terms. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But if we don't, there's dire consequences, right? Are you thankful for God's word? Are you thankful for God's spirit? You know, out of God's grace, he gives us of his spirit. He gives us that which we need to be successful in God's eyes. Not about money, power, all those things, but obedient to the word. He gives us everything that we need. And so we go back to Galatians 5, verse 16, where it says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before... As I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's talking about a habit, a series of proofs that we are not, we are not regenerate. We don't have a desire to get away from our adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, and on and on and on. We're not grieved by it. It doesn't bother us. If it does, we don't care. And it's proof that we're not saved. And that's why he says that there. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't take that to mean as you can kind of find that in First John and other places. Don't take that to mean, oh, well, I tripped up. I lost my salvation. No, you can't lose your salvation. You didn't save yourself and you don't keep yourself saved. God loved you enough to save you, right? And God loves you enough to keep you saved. There's nothing you can do to pry yourself out of his hand. There's plenty of pretenders. There's plenty of people that, you know, give good lip service, but have no good fruit come out of their lives. And eventually many of those show themselves for who they really are. And it seems like, oh, so-and-so lost their salvation. No, so-and-so was never saved. So-and-so was never saved. We live in a country, especially, where people are not made to prove their salvation. It's, it's just, oh, well, you're here, so let's put this person into a leadership position, make this person a deacon, make, put this person in the ministry. And, do, and I've seen it time after time after time after time. And no one's ever made to prove themselves. I had a preacher friend who commented online and he asked the question, and I've encountered this myself, what do you do when someone comes up to you and says that they're not being fed in church? You ever hear that one? What do you do if someone comes up and says, I'm, not, I'm just not being fed? Well, this, this gentleman's only been at his church for a few months. First, that's not very fair. <laughs> that's not very fair at all, but people aren't fair. But I, I said, oh, ask them to start discipleship. So go up to them and say, okay, well, let's, let's meet you know, one time out of the week for a time and study the Bible together. I said, they'll, they'll probably say no. 
because that's about how it is. The people that act in such a way generally don't have a personal devotional walk, nor are they interested in that. You say, are there people that are interested? Sure there are. Sure there are. But they're a lot fewer and far between than I thought they were years ago. They're very rare today. It's sad. You may say, well, I love God's word and I want to follow it. Praise God for that because I do too. But folks, we have to understand we live in a very spiritually corrupt day. Very spiritually corrupt day. There are many of the sins that we look through over the past weeks and months, they're accepted in churches. They're not preached against. It's not a concern. And it's sad because we ought to... Um, we ought to take these things very seriously. So we're looking at revelings. Revelings, by way of definition, kids, you're going to have to know this for tomorrow, word for word. I'm saying this sarcastically. It's a very long one, as you know if you're here Sunday. A nocturnal riotous procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows who, after supper, parade through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus or some other deity, and sing and play before the houses of their male and female friends. Or maybe this, the more palatable definition, feasting with noisy merriment, which is Webster's. The first being the lexicon, the second being Webster's 1828. Partying in the streets, acting the fool, being out of control, right? And so it, it's quite amazing with this list how these fruits of the flesh tend to be joined together, and drunkenness and revelings are no, no different. By the way, murders and drunkenness are no, no different either. People do get killed because of people being drunk, right? And other things in that list. So we considered on Sunday that God is a God of self-control, we live in a day where it is acceptable for people to be out of control. People think it's cute, and God doesn't think so. Plenty of so-called Christians act this way, and God's not amused. See, when we're out of control, people say, oh, I just can't help it. Well, we, we must help it. <laughs> we must help it if we're saved. We must help it. Dari talk, talked about our wrath, our temper, and Mr. Spurgeon gave a good quote on that where people say, I just can't help my temper. He says, you must help it. But it's, people don't care. People don't care. But if you're saved and I'm saved, we care. Why? Because we're all of Christ that this world will see besides creation and the conscience that lives within we are the testimony for Jesus. So if you and I go out and act the fool and the world sees it, well, guess what that does to the name of Christ? And there's plenty of people that say, well, I don't care about that. Well, that's fine. Those people probably aren't saved. But if you're saved, you care. Because you love the Savior that saved you. And you want to please him. And his word is the foundation for your life. If you're saved, you care, right? So we want to be in control. When we mess up, we say, ah, instead of, ha, ah, that was so funny. No, we say, ah, and we ask for forgiveness. We care. When we're out of control, we're filled with the flesh. The world promotes being out of control and churches too. When we're in control of ourselves, we're filled with the Spirit. That's what temperance is, self-control, self-control. As we see it in, at the very end of the list of the fruit of the Spirit, we'll likely come back to this again because it'll be several weeks into the future, if not months. And so we considered the moderation of our habits and our passions or our emotions, Right? Moderation of our habits and our emotions or passions. We all have them. We all have habits, good and bad. 
We all have emotions, right? And it's not wrong to have habits. It's not wrong to have emotions. What's wrong is being controlled by those things. We just looked at that with drunkenness. Don't be under the control of anything. People allow themselves to be under the control of their anger, fear, worry, lust, and what have you. And it ought not be. We have to work and work hard and work the rest of our lives against such things. And so we ended with the quote by Spurgeon on get temperance or self-control of life, lip, thought, and heart. Get temperance of life, lip, thought, and heart. And with God's help, we can do each one of these. So number two, and to finish up with this, God demands that we associate with godly individuals. And we've covered this, surround ourselves with the right people. One way we know that we're filled with the Spirit is when we do surround ourselves with the right people because we'll want to be around those people. We won't want to be around ungodly people. Now, do we have to be around ungodly people? Yes, yes we do, because we live in the world. We live in the world. And 1 Corinthians even says, it's not about, let me see if I can find it real quick because it's not in my notes. But 1 Corinthians even says it's, it's not about going out of the world, or there it is. He says in verse number nine of 1 Corinthians five, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Company, be friends with, be around all the time, be influenced by, right? Yet it says not all together with the fornicators of this world. It says I'm not talking about, not talking about Avoiding people altogether, isolationism. You know, some people, a lot of very, very cultic people do this. They build their compounds, make a commune way out in the mountains, away from everyone else, because they feel like they need to get away from all the quote-unquote sinners and whatever. That's not what we're called to do. Paul says, not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then ye must needs go out of the world. The only way we're going to get away from sin is to go to Mars or go to the moon, and even then we wouldn't get away from it because it lies within us. So the balance that Paul speaks of, he says, but now have I written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. We have to especially watch who calls themselves Christians, who we are around. Because many people call themselves Christians, but very few actually believe in Christ and try to follow his word. You know, if we would, if the churches would live this passage, we'd be in a much better place today. But the world has infiltrated the churches and the churches decide to act like the world. Regardless, regardless, we have to watch who we are around. We'll surround ourselves with the right people. People that will help us follow Christ, not people that will hurt our walk with Christ. Do we have to work in the world? Yes, we do, unless you're going to start some Christian company somewhere and only hire Christians, and even then you won't get away from sinners because everyone's a sinner. It's about learning how to deal with the world, as we taught Phoebe, we're teaching Sarah, we're teaching Jimmy. You, you, you work with people, and the people at work aren't going to be your friends because they're not Christians. They're going to talk like the world. They're going to go to worldly places. They're going to do worldly things. Doesn't mean you can't be kind because we ought to be kind. And there's that, there's that you know, strain where you, you want 
You want to be friends with people, but you can't because they're not going to help your walk. And so you just maintain a godly testimony. You pray for them to get saved. And you witness as you have opportunity. And maybe some of them will accept Christ. But we shouldn't isolate ourselves. Honestly, truly, too many, and pastors especially, make this mistake. Don't they, dear? Pastors especially make this mistake with their little, whatever you want to call them, with their kids. And they say, well, well, my little snookums, they can't, they can't go out into the world and work. They'll be consumed alive. Well, they won't if you taught them anything. They won't if you train them to live in the world, but these kids aren't trained. And I kid you not, because I went to college with them. They come from a pastor's home in a bubble. They went to a Christian college in a bubble. They graduate from the Christian college and go straight to work for mommy or daddy or some other church in the bubble. And then these people wonder, why my child fall away from the Lord? Why are they out of church? They weren't ever taught anything about how to defend their faith or to live in the world. So the wolves came in and just ate them up. It's exactly what happens. Sarah and I have seen it time after time after time. You don't, you, you don't keep your kids, at, yeah, keep them in a bubble, but prepare them to be outside the bubble, right? Because one day they're going to live in the real world. <laughs> The real world is full of wolves. They have to learn that God will take care of them. And they have to learn to surround themselves with the right people. I mean, my wife went to work at Friendly's. She was, she was offered cigarettes, I don't know how many times. Yeah, you know, all the time and things like that. And did she ever smoke? No. Because she was told it was wrong. At least I assume she was told it was wrong. And after she started, after the time, what was it? The guy offered you and you finally took one. You took it and snapped it and dropped it on the ground. And you said, that was fun. Can I have another? The guy stopped offering, didn't he? Oh, he didn't stop after that? He gave me a second one. Oh, he gave you a second one? Then he stopped. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you learn how to deal with it. Godly people are those that will love God's word. Not people that say they love God's word, but people that prove they do and encourage us to obey it. That's who we should surround ourselves with. We have a great amount of control in our lives. A great amount of control. You know, if, if Phoebe had, I should... I should be all inclusive. If Phoebe and Sarah, since they're both working in the same place now, if they had a great deal of trouble at Ace, then I would look at both of them and say, you need to get out of there. And so would my wife. So you need to go find another job. We have a great amount of control in our lives. It's not that you're like enslaved to any one job, for instance. You know, we're, I, th I think we're past that pretty much in our society. We are where we want to be. You know, for instance, y'all aren't keeping me here. <laughs> I can go where I want to be. It's just the truth. But I want to be here because God wants us here. You can do that with your job. Uh, you, you're pretty well tied into your family, but even when you get of a certain age, you can control that sort of thing, right? We can control who are our friends. People say, oh, no, I can't. No, it's, it's you're not willing to say no. And we can control those things. So look at the three things this evening. One, one, it's where our counsel is to come from. Who influences your life? Who do you look for for advice? Is it ungodly Aunt Margaret? down in another state who has always given you bad advice, but you listen because you're related to her? 
Or is it the godly person that will always point you to Jesus? Friend, relative, minister, whatever. If we are saved, we want to know God's mind. And God's mind is found right here in this book. God's will and God's word never conflict. See, Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So a person is cursed if they follow ungodly advice. But blessed if we follow godly advice. If we dedicate our lives, and this, this should be each and every one of us, you say that you're saved, each and every one of us should dedicate our lives to following the counsel of the godly, to stand in the way of the righteous, to sit in the seat of the wise, of those that love God's word, right? The world has plenty of opinions for you, and you can find exactly what your fleshly heart is looking for. So can't I. The fact is this, not many people promote God's word, but there are people that do. We just have to find them. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That bringeth forth his fruit in the season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Jesus talks in Matthew chapter 7, as you well know, about making his word to be our foundation. We'll be strong, right? Psalm 73, about following God's word instead of following the way of the wicked, the way of this world. Our feet will not slip. Different illustrations, terms that are used in Scripture. If you follow this book, you will stand sure. Will the world come against you? Yeah, at times. Will the devil? Oh, you can be sure. You can be sure that Satan will come after you. He will, he will oppress you. And God will allow it. But it doesn't mean we should forsake God's word. You will see some of the greatest victories in your life, some of the greatest blessings that you never thought you would see as you follow Christ. You also see some of the greatest burdens and some of the greatest times of grief. But it's a blessing nonetheless to follow God's word. It's where our counsel must come from. We have to seek the advice of people that love God's word. Seek the advice of people that love God's word. You know where we say in Proverbs, and the multitude of counselors, their safety. It talks about wisdom and godliness. We have to seek people that love God's word that will not say, well, well, Jimmy, this is what I think you should do because this is what I did and it worked out fine. No, Jimmy, this is what you should do because this is what God says you should do. This is where it's found in Scripture. It doesn't matter whether I did it or not, whether I've experienced it or not. I couldn't tell you the number of people. You know, this is just our flesh. People look and say, well, you don't understand what I'm going through because you've never been there. I don't need to understand. I've never been there, no. But God's Word hasn't changed. Right? We can all play that little game. But in the end, God's word hasn't changed. When people say, you don't know what I've been through, they really don't want your help. For some insane reason, people are very happy being miserable. Very happy spiraling into despair. Very happy blaming everyone else for their problems when they so often have other people around them saying, let me help you, let me help you, let me help you. While they sit ignorantly in their corner saying, oh, nobody loves me. <laughs> now, are there people that genuinely have that 
where they do not have help, yes. But most of the time, people have help. Seek godly counsel. Seek godly counsel and reject ungodly counsel. The opinions of people are just that, they're opinions. They're a dime a dozen, and gen generally they're worthless, aren't they? Seek godly counsel. You can't get any better than the words of the Bible. And if you read through the book of Proverbs, you'll find over and over, you read through Psalms over and over, the word of God is precious. The word of God is a great treasure. The word of God is better than riches. The word of God over and over and over again. It says it because it's true. You might be poor. You might not have much in this world, but it's better to be godly, better to follow Christ, better to have, the Bible says, a godly wife, better to have a godly family than to have all the riches in the world than to have all the power of any king. Because we have God. We have God. It's where our counsel is to come from. Number two, it is who we will eventually become. You might be a person that loves God and his word today, but if you surround yourself with ungodly people, eventually their poison will seep into you and you will backslide. It happens, and it has happened time after time. I've seen it happen with clergymen and parishioner, parishioners alike. I could give you their names. You wouldn't know who they are. Or maybe you would. It's who we will eventually become. Who we are around is who we will become. It's guaranteed. Who we allow to influence us. Like we've, we've told Phoebe, you go to Bob Jones, you need to surround yourselves with godly people. She's in full control of that. Because Sarah and I know college. Maybe you know college too. People, there, there's all flavors of people at college. And you choose who you want to be around. The Bible commands us to avoid the ungodly, Proverbs 1, 8 through 19, and then chapter 13 through 20, or verse number 20. We see the example of Samson. Samson is often, oh, he was a man of great strength. Yeah, who gave him that strength? God. Not Samson, God. And who took away Samson's strength too? God. Why? Because Samson played around with the Philistines. Samson didn't take his oath seriously. Samson went in to prostitutes. Samson married a heathen girl. Samson, <laughs> yeah, messed around with a dead lion and gave the honey to his parents. Samson let Delilah know that he thought his hair was the source of his power. So God said, okay. And so once his hair was gone, so was the power of God. Samson messed around and was burnt. That might take days, months, or years. But we can be guaranteed if we mess around too, we're going to get burnt. Solomon, wisest man on the face of the earth, wrote much of the book of Proverbs, wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, wrote many more books beyond that on science and other things. He messed around with idols, married a thousand women. They turned his heart from the Lord. He got burnt because he refused to stay wise. That's our choice, by the way. We're not to be the companion of fools, lest we become fools ourselves. We're commanded to avoid the ungodly. We're commanded to avoid entangling ourselves with the ungodly. Exodus 34, 12 through 16. God knows our hearts. We've read this passage before. If it wasn't this one, it was another one. 
where God talks about the people of the land that uh, of Canaan, verse number 12, Exodus 34, he says, take heed to thyself, meaning guard yourself. Kids, guard yourselves. Adults, guard yourselves. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. And how many people have ensnared themselves? And nowadays, many churches, colleges, families, they don't think a thing of it. Not a thing of it entangling themselves with the world. Exodus 34, verse 12, verse 13 now. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groups. Not play around with it, but get rid of that junk. Not keep it for a historical site to, to consider archaeology, but destroy it because it's evil. It's idols. There's demons affiliated with it. It's anti-God. He says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. You've probably seen it. I've seen it too. People marry into ungodly families, and they say, oh, I'll be okay. Then before you know it, they turn Catholic. They turn Lutheran. They turn Mormon. They turn Methodist. They turn this, that, the other. Oh, I'll be okay. And they're not okay because they didn't listen to God's word. They listened to the lusts of their own heart. We're commanded to avoid entangling ourselves with the ungodly. Second Chronicles 6, 14 through 18 say that the godly and ungodly are two different mindsets. Right? Two different natures. Unsaved people are given over and enslaved to their flesh. Saved people have a new nature that unsaved people do not understand. Unsaved people say, how can they read that book? How can they follow after the Bible? Why should they follow after Jesus? How can they give 10% of our income to the church? How can they uh, send their kids off on mission trips. How can they do this and that? And the other? That's what unsaved people think. But saved people have a new nature. We have the Spirit of God living within us. And what's normal and acceptable and pleasing to the Lord in our minds because it lines up with God's Word, the world thinks is crazy. The preaching of the cross is to them the parish foolishness, right? But to us is the power of God. We're commanded to avoid entangling ourselves with the ungodly, and we're commanded to avoid becoming ungodly ourselves. We have to work on our own Christian walks. Work on our own Christian walks and work hard on them. Each and every one of us. We, we are not filled with the Spirit by chance, just like we're not saved by accident, right? And just so, you're not going to grow, and I'm not going to grow in Christ by accident. It takes work. It takes effort. And there's plenty of people that say, well, I'm not going to do that. Well, that's up to them. That's up to them. We're commanded to avoid becoming ungodly ourselves. 1 Timothy 4.12 Let no man despise thy youth, but thee that be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, excuse me, conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God. How many times have we looked at this? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, working on our Christian walk. First Peter 5, 1 through 3, says similar things. And also working to help one another grow in Christ. That's where the edification comes from. Where it's not about me, it's about you. 
and trying to help you grow in Christ. Now, people, if they don't want help, that's up to them. If they don't want my wife's help, that's up to them. So we say, all right, well, just let us know. But for the people that say, yeah, I want to walk with Jesus, praise the Lord. You know, it's our job to encourage one another. Iron sharpeneth iron. How many times have we heard that, right? Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 15, Philippians 2 and 1 through 4, and other places talk about helping one another to walk with Christ. That's what the church is for. Helping one another. Philippians 2, verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies... Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, being in unity, right? Of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. The church is not to be full of fighting. It's not to be full of pride, but humility and unity, right? As it says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And that's not speaking for, for obtaining wealth or goods. It's to help others grow in Christ. That's what uh, 1 Corinthians speaks of also. Looking on the things of others. Helping each other to grow in Christ. But if we don't surround ourselves with good people, we won't do that, will we? God demands we associate with godly individuals. It's where our counsel is to come from. It's who we will eventually become. Lastly, this evening, it's how we prove our salvation. See, the world generally cares very little for separation, but God's people care about separating from darkness and promoting truth and light, right? We're told to separate from the world and to the Lord. From the world and to the Lord. We've looked at that in Haggai and other places, 2 Corinthians. And if we're not separating from the world to the Lord, then we're separating from the Lord and to the world. We choose. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And there's too many so-called believers that love the world way too much. If Jesus were to come back today, they would not be happy because they would be leaving their stuff. Would you be happy if Christ came tonight? Would you be ready? Can you not wait to see him? To be with him in heaven? I mean, that's... Aren't you just ready to get, get out of this place? I mean, I don't know about you, but I am. <laughs> to put it in very simple terms, this place is messed up, isn't it? But it's because of sin. We're the ones that messed it up. But while we're here, we're here because God has a use for us, each and every one of us. We're alive today because God has a purpose for us, and Christ has tarried his coming so far because Christ has a purpose for us. And so we live looking for that blessed hope, as it says in Titus, and waiting for that rest that Hebrews talks about in chapter 11. You say life gets burdensome. Yes, it does. But it also has its blessings. As we walk in this world, we're commanded to love Christ, not it. Not it, not have things as our goal, not have the things of this world as our goal, but have Christ and what he has for us and who he has for us and be thankful for it. We're commanded not to love the world. And we're commanded to reject error and follow after truth. This is truth. This is all truth. The world lives in error. It lives, it's, oh my, we, we look at things online 
some funny, some interesting. And I think I commented on this on Sunday, the, the little Katie did that flares up like a peacock, just a little bug that looks like a broken leaf. Then when you, he gets defensive, he flares up. And this guy comments, oh, look how he evolved. And yeah, it's just craziness to think evolution's real. We just saw this, I forget what the thing's called, this little worm that sprays glue and it, it has these glue guns and it, it like cements its prey down into place. It's crazy. People say, oh, look how it evolved. It's impossible for these things to have evolved. We looked at the possum last night and this guy is explaining all these things about a possum. You, you have to realize how the theory of evolution, which is all it is, the theory works, is if, if one piece evolves incorrectly, then the animal's dead. <laughs> it doesn't exist. And you, you have all these various animals out there. There's one piece of them. There's no way it could have evolved. It's just impossible. It's like... Dad said, we were talking about that. It's like, well, watch me go through New York City or you could go through downtown Chattanooga, point up at that building and say, isn't that amazing how that evolved like that? And people look at you like you're crazy. They say, well, somebody built that. Yeah, well, somebody built you too. Somebody built you too. His name is God. You and I are impossible organic machines. <laughs> impossible. But God created us. And so much of this world is impossible. But God. Well, that's just one aspect of the error that this world believes. And that's what they base many things off of. Folks, we have to learn to reject error and follow after truth. What is truth? Jesus says that God's word is truth. God's word is truth. You say, are there other true things in the world besides God's word? Well, sure there are. But you'll never find anything that is all truth than the Bible. And what an important thing to base our lives off of. God's word. You're basing your very being, your very living, your very eternity off of that. And there's nothing more solid to base it off of. There's nothing better to base your life off of. I, I, I would challenge you to show me. I know you don't want to. Because many, if not all of you, believe in God's word. But I think you agree with me. It's the best thing we can follow. Because you want to follow what Dr. Phil has to say and put your eggs in his basket you know, follow what Joe Biden or Donald Trump say, put your eggs in their baskets or some other political figure, world leader. What about some scientists, you know, and their theories and their uncertainties where you, they say, well, you can't know anything for sure. Well, I, I differ. Yeah, sure you can. It's found in this book. It's found in this book. It's all about a choice. When we're filled with the Spirit, we'll choose to associate with godly individuals. We'll choose to take our counsel from God's Word and godly individuals who love God's Word. We'll choose to do these things because it pleases Christ. It might not always please us all the time. We might not have as many friends that want to be around us, but it pleases Christ. Christ. That's all that matters. Father, I pray you take these things this evening, that you would help us. We'll thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Any prayer requests tonight? Okay. Pray for Pat's unspoken request.
Anyone else? Okay. Pray for Brad as he's gone to London. And Brad, Brad needs to be saved too. Pray for Brad. Anyone else? Pray for Matthew, if you would, as he's at college, and Phoebe as she's getting ready for and doing college. The kids as they're doing high school for the next four years. And my mother, she's healing, and Miss Midge as she's healing. My father as he's working on this state. All that is coming together, so thank you for praying for them. Any other prayer requests? Okay, pray for Pat with her unspoken request and Brad as he's headed to London. Going across the pond, as they say. All right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time and we pray that you would help us to be made better for you. Help us to be those that encourage others to follow Christ. We pray for each and every person in our lives that needs you. Pray that you will work on their hearts and help them to turn to Jesus. Each one of us has family members and friends that need you. We just pray you'd work. We know you are working. We just pray you'd, you'd work and you'd save and the backslidden would get right and the unsaved would trust in Christ. We'll rejoice in all that. Pray you'd help us to be good testimonies to folks and give no calls for any ruin to your name. Lord, we pray you be with Brad as he's going to London. Pray you keep him safe. We also pray you draw him to you and show him his need for you. And that he turn to you. Pray for Susan's family with that also. Lord, we pray that you be with Pat's unspoken request, that you'd help with that. You know the need. We pray you take care of it perfectly. And that you would work as only you can. And you get the glory out of it. Pray you be with Dad as he's working on this state. That you give him the strength and wisdom that he needs. Help the family members to be good. And treat him well. Pray you'd help Mom as she heals, as she's still in some pain and her body's trying to heal from this, and just pray you'd help her. This midge with her hip, that she'd heal well, that you draw her close to you through this. And pray you'd be with Matthew as he's in school, that you'd help him guide him, give him everything that he needs. Pray you'd help Phoebe as she's working on these classes and headed to college next year. Lord willing, we just pray you continue to guide there. We thank you for doing so and doing so clearly. Pray you be with the kids as they're going through high school, that you continue to help them with their, their classes and to have good grades and be diligent studies. We thank you for the Nine weeks we've had so far this year. Thank you that things are going well. Thank you the jobs are going well. Thank you for leading us perfectly, blessing us in various ways, helping us. Lord, we need you every day. Help us to be in your word, to crave it, to feast off of it. 
please teach us. We'll thank you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to 350, if you would, please, and we'll stand together. 350 is tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. 350, let's stand together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. God bless you for being here tonight. We trust your week will go well and that God will answer and guide and direct as he sees fit. So we'll be praying for you. Hope to see you Sunday. If you need anything, please let us know. God bless you.